welcome to our worship service from the Unitarian Society of Northampton and Florence. I'm Laura Porter and I'm your Zoom tech host this morning. And Rebecca Smith is my co-host. We're very glad to see you here. We strive to be a congregation that welcomes people of all ages, races, religious beliefs, backgrounds, gender identities, and abilities. We belong to the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations, and we are guided and inspired by its values and principles. Those values and principles move us to remember that we in Northampton inhabited unceded land of the Pecumtuck and Nipmuc peoples. Our values and principles remind us to acknowledge our responsibility to face all the painful legacies of dispossession and systemic racism that are part of our collective history, even as we affirm and celebrate the legacies that inspire us. We are here to support and celebrate one another and to renew ourselves with hope and gratitude and new resolve. If you are new and returning after a time away, welcome. We're very glad you're here, but please feel free to fill out a virtual visitor card. Doing that allows you to put us on our email contact list. And there is a link to that card in the chat room. We ask that you remain muted throughout the service and please turn off your videos now we will put them back on during the greeting. Turning them off helps the technology work as smoothly as possible throughout the service. And we hope you stay afterwards for social hours. It is a great way to engage in meaningful conversations with people you might not otherwise have met. And now we'll begin our service.
wonder of being together, so close yet so far apart. We gather to listen, to ponder, to celebrate. We gather in reverence before intangible things that our eyes do not see, our ears do not hear, our hands do not touch, and time cannot measure. And now please join in saying the words to accompany lighting our chalice as Booker lights it for us this morning. We light our chalice to renew our faith in the goodness and beauty of life, to reaffirm the way of open minds and full hearts, and to rekindle the flame of memory and of hope. The story this morning is called All Because You Matter by Tammy Charles. The light is coming in through the window. Sorry about that. Um, Tammy Charles wrote this book for her son to help him start to think about what it, what's gonna, what it was going to be like to grow up as a Black boy in our world. But she also wrote it for parents and caregivers to have the important conversations about racial justice in our country. And that's something that we've been talking a lot about with parent and caregiver groups here. So I hope you'll all enjoy this story. Because You Matter by Tammy Charles, illustrated by Brian Collier. They say that matter is all things that make up the universe, energy, stars, space. If that's the case, then you, dear child, matter. Building, inventing, working beneath red hot suns and cold blue moons, thinking of you years ahead, because to them, you always mattered. On the night you were born, stars sprayed across the sky, each one full of light, hope, love, and all the moments in your life that would matter. Like your first steps, bare feet planted on cold floor, hobbling, wobbling, toppling, only to stand and try again or your first words spoken almost like a lullaby, notes climbing a ladder to the sky, mama, papa, or the first time you opened a book, like a mirror staring back at you and really saw yourself, same hair, same skin, same dreams. The words and pictures coming together like sweet jam on toast, musica blasting through barrios, sun in blue sky, all because you matter. But in galaxies far away, it may seem that light does not always reach lonely planets, 
covered moons, stars unseen, as if matter no longer exists. And just like moons hidden in the dark, there will be times when you too will question your place in the universe. Like the time you'll hear the teacher call your name, Hosam, Uzomaka, Yordanus, and the whispers and giggles begin, followed by, what kind of name is that? Or the time you'll see a letter, big, bold, red on the page, and you will question if you and your work and your effort matter. Or the time when your pop pop turns on the news and you see people everywhere take a breath, take a stand, take a knee. And you hear pop pop's whispered prayers as another name is called Trayvon, Tamir, Philando. And you wonder if they or you will ever matter. But did you know that you do? Did you know that you were born from queens, chiefs, legends? Did you know that you are the earth, that strength, power, and beauty lie within you? Did you know that you are sun rays, calm like ocean waves, tough like montañas, magic like stars in space? And on the day the universe was created, you were thought of, dreamed of, carried like a knapsack full of wishes as planets, stars, moons took their places, making room for you, your people, their dreams, your future. All because since the beginning of time, you mattered, they mattered, we matter and always will. Thank you, Jessica. That's a beautiful story. And now I invite you to rise in body or spirit and to join in singing hymn number 1051, We Are.
you can turn on your videos now and say hello to one another. Special welcome to everyone who might be visiting with us for the first time. If you are, please put your name in the chat so that we can offer a personal welcome. You might want to switch to gallery view. Hello, Harriet Wright. Hello, Justina, good morning, good morning, good morning. Can't see anybody yet, except I have to scroll. Hey, Joan. Emily, Flora, Craig and Diane, running through. Alice Subers, great to see you. Oh, it's a whole, the whole Wright family is there. Hello, Claire. Hello, Catherine and Dave. Hello, Laurel. Judy Harwood, nice to see you. We've got the whole Harwood family here today. Hi, Amy. Runa and Runa. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, Marlisa, nice to see you. Hello, Jane, nice to see you. Noel, so many people. Celia, hello. Hello, hello, hello. It's so wonderful to see you all. I can't see, a lot of people have their screens off, which is okay. You're here, you're here with us in body, if not in picture. So I do hope many of you will stay for social hour. For some people, it's the best part of the whole meeting, and it is a wonderful way to meet new people. And uh, we'll now end the greeting, and I believe it's time to sing out everyone who is going to religious education. Good morning, I'm Julie Kinsman. The Unitarian writer Eric Walker Wickstrom maintains that the deepest reason why people come to church is to have their lives transformed. That did not occur to me when I first attended services here in 1994. I came seeking community and connection with like-minded individuals. I found that in my involvement with various groups here, but it was when I served on the board years later that I felt myself deeply changed. Stepping into leadership challenged me to grow in unimagined ways. I learned that how we do what we do here matters more than what we get accomplished. I learned from the example of my mentors about the spiritual principles of compassion, humility, patience, gratitude, and discernment. And I came to truly appreciate our system of government governance. 
Despite the disturbing threats to democracy in our country today, we have a democratic process here that actually works. Where deep listening and respect are the rule. Serving as your president was a path to self-discovery, enrichment and joy, deepening my connection to the membership. My appreciation for this congregation has expanded over this past year as I benefited from much caring support during my recovery from a serious fall last winter. I'm also very grateful that despite the pandemic, we are taking actions here in alignment with our principles. I've managed well with isolation because of all the opportunities to remain engaged. Through Sunday Zoom services, postcard campaigns prior to the election, initiatives of the racial justice and climate action teams, Janet's weekly meditation circle, and my UU connection circle where we share deeply and offer mutual encouragement. The Dalai Lama has said, my true religion is kindness. Here I feel enveloped by kindness and through the example of others have been able to find the best in myself and to manifest this in service to others. I donate what I can afford to because I cannot imagine my life without this community. Thank you, Julie. My contributions this morning are in three parts. This is part one, and it begins with the very beginning of the book of Genesis in the King James Version. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. That's the beginning. The beginning, the book of Genesis begins with a myth, the myth of Earth's creation in the beginning. The King James Version is, is the, the least, well, I wouldn't say it's the least accurate. It's not very accurate as a translation, but it is the most beautiful. Genesis is full of old, old stories, some of the oldest in what became Western civilization stories that were foundational to a worldview and a culture dominated by Christianity in various forms for nearly 2,000 years. And that is a worldview and a culture of which we are very much a part. Among the stories, there are genealogies, and these are long recitals. Some of them go on for pages, beginning with the male descendants of Seth, who is Adam and Eve's third son, down through the ages to Noah, and the men in that time lived for hundreds of years, hundreds and hundreds. There are no women in those genealogies. Childbirth was dangerous even in myths, so I expect the women died off sooner. The genealogies offer up the math that led people to believe into the 19th century and for some even up to today that the earth was formed a mere four or 5,000 years ago. So if you want to know how old the earth is, you just can do the arithmetic in those genealogies. 
We first learn about Abraham, who is the father of Israel in the last genealogy in the first part of Genesis. This is chapter 11. And that's the first time that women are mentioned, two of them, Abram's wife Sarai and his brother's wife Milcah. The Hebrew Bible is a compilation of different sources stitched together over the course of a thousand years or more. And one of those sources refers to the deity with just with letters, yod heh vah heh and that's an abbreviation for the words Moses hears from the burning bush, I am that I am. Another source refers to the deity as Elohim, and that's, you see in that, in the Jewish Bibles, that's Adonai. Christian Bibles translate yod heh as God, and they translate Elohim as the Lord. So when you read the Bible, the, the Hebrew Bible, and you think a story backtracks or is happening again in a different way, you're right. There are two versions that are stitched together, and sometimes the stitching shows. So over the next few weeks, I'm planning to tell some of the stories of the patriarchs, and finally ending with Moses, and to the extent possible of the women who accompanied them. All of them are these archetypal, pivotal characters who are part of Israel's mythical prehistory and part of our culture. And I hope you'll decide with me that the stories are rich and many layered. These are stories that have bred and still breed many stories, as well as plays and poems and musical competition, compositions and works of art. And they offer us opportunities for reflection. They give us some insight also into bedrock understandings and beliefs about human nature, about what human beings need to survive, about human relationships, beliefs about what it takes to be a moral and ethical person, about humanity's place in the web of life, and about who and what God may be and mean. And now Fran Adams has a social justice minute for us. Fran, you need to unmute yourself. There we go. How there about you go. Good. My name is Fran Adams, and I'm speaking to you as a member of the Climate Action Group. The focus this morning is to encourage all of us to consider once again ways we can reduce our meat consumption. Or if we do eat meat, what stores in this area source their meat from local as opposed to factory farms? We've all read about how meat and poultry production are major contributors to greenhouse gas production and therefore contribute to global warming. In addition, the water requirements to produce a meat product, beef being the most wasteful, make the process highly inefficient. Consider too that corporations like Cargill and JBS are burning the Amazon rainforests, the lungs of the earth, to create more grazing land for beef, adding insult to injury. Last summer, in another Climate Action Minute, we learned about the scope of Cargill's marketing in particular. In Western Mass alone, they supply beef to Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, Stop and Shop, Lion Foods, Hannaford, Costco, McDonald's, and Burger King. In order to limit the impact of Cargill's reach, I am appealing to you to shop at stores that do not engage in factory farming. And there are many stores in this area that do not. Stores such as Big Y, River Valley Market, Big E's, Greenfields Market, the North Hadley Sugar Shack, and Pure Foods and Arnold, Mo Arnold Meats, both of which advertise in the Daily Hampshire Gazette weekly, 
on an even smaller scale, Outlook Farm in West Hampton, Sheikon Farm in East Hampton are more stores that need our support. Any effort we can make to support smaller stores that do not sell factory meat will be beneficial to the planet. I know that many of you who are vegetarian or vegan, vegan have been talking about this lesson for years. I'm speaking to the rest of us who have trouble limiting our diets to plant-based. Perhaps setting a goal of no meat on two or three days a week would be a manageable way to begin to change our habits. I'm here to ask you to try to consider whatever small yet significant ways you might adapt your shopping and eating habits to consume less meat, fish, and dairy products, and to try to shop at stores that offer only locally sourced products. Thank you for listening. Now it's time to take a gratitude moment to consider sharing our gifts with the Unitarian Society and other organizations that serve our communities and our values. And the, as I said, uh, the Coordinating Council selected those. They're the Movement Voter Project, Hands Up for Haiti, Cathedral in the Night, which is a local uh, meal that's served to the homeless every Sunday, First Nation De Development Institutes, COVID Emergency Response Fund, and our wonderful partner in immigration justice, the Pioneer Valley Workers Center. Thank you for your generosity, and now we will enjoy Lemmy's Offertory.
Our meditation this morning is a Apache blessing. May the sun bring you new energy by day. May the moon softly restore you by night. May the rain wash away your worries. May the breeze blow new strength into your being. May you walk gently through the world and know its beauty all the days of your life. Let's take a moment in silence. So Abram, as he is first called, is, I think I counted it right, an eighth-generation descendant of Noah's son, Shem. And when the story begins, he's living in Haran, which is in part of what is now Turkey. So this is a little bit of the first few verses of Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. He took his wife Sarai and his brother's son Lot and all the possessions they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran, and they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. So Abram's doing just fine in Haran. The rest of his family, his whole extended family is there. He and his nephew Lot have herds and a retinue of slaves or servants, and yet off he goes into a country he has never seen, his fate unknown. So the first question is why? And I think he goes because he is called. Abraham, as he will be renamed later in the story, is really a poster child for obedience. That might be why he gets picked. But I'm thinking maybe he also responded to a yearning to matter, to be noticed, to be given something important to do, to survive and live on in the blood and the memories of those who come after. Now what about Sarai, Abram's wife? This poem was written by 
an architect and poet from Zimbabwe named Itai Oscar. He writes, early that morning, Abram had told Sarai to pack their belongings because they were leaving their kindred. He did not unwrap what their destiny was because he didn't know either. Sarai was greatly confused because her father had a god. She'd seen it in his bedroom. Her father-in-law had gods. She'd seen them in his living room. But this god her husband was talking about was invisible. Abram claimed he heard his voice. She had heard about one of their neighbors when she was growing up, who had heard voices and was taken to an asylum. Psychiatrists had a name for that condition. But like any respectable woman, she'd obeyed her husband. She packed and left to a place God was going to show them. Now Abram and Sarah are our parents in the faith. So Abram, Abraham, is a model of obedience. He is faithful, and he is also loyal to a wife who cannot provide what a wife is supposed to provide. He's 75 years old, and he has no children. He has not taken another wife, even though polygamy is common and very acceptable. Maybe that's another reason why Sarai packs and follows. As I mentioned, Sarai and Milcah are the only women mentioned in the genealogies that begin with Adam and Eve. Well, we won't count Eve. Sarai even gets her own sentence. It's the last one in the chapter. Now, Sarai was barren. She had no child. What was important in that long ago time and place where nomadic peoples tended their flocks and kept moving to find grazing land? Children were important. And I think this was a long, long time before anyone would sing about a morning star rising when a child was born, but children mattered. Wives could be discarded they were discarded if they couldn't bear children. Children mattered. When they grew older, they shared the work. They continued the family line. They were a reminder to the adults to work for a better future. And they needed love, and they offered love, just as they do today. Please join us in singing the lullaby, Sleep My Child. Thank you. 
Now there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt, for the famine was severe. He said to his wife Sarai, I know well that you are a woman beautiful in appearance, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife, and then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you are my sister, so that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life will be spared on your account. When the officials of Pharaoh saw Sarai, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, Pharaoh dwelt well with Abram, and Abram had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female slaves, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues, and Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister, so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here she is. Take her and be gone. This is an odd story. It's hard to admire Abram at this point. He lies about who Sarai is. He allows Pharaoh to use his wife for his own protection and ultimately his great gain, realizing that the plagues or believing that the plagues come from Abram's God, Pharaoh gives back Abram's wife and sends him away a wealthy man. What does Sarai think of all this? She doesn't get very many lines, so we don't know. But she does stay loyal. What does this story remind you of or make you think of? Maybe you stopped briefly on the detail of plague, thinking about a future story, yes. Also, thinking of all the innocent people in this story and later stories who suffered because of Abram's and Pharaoh's shenanigans. Maybe reminded of all the innocent people in our own 21st century plague and maybe of the different beliefs about who and what are responsible for them. Abram took his flocks and his people to Egypt to escape famine. Again, that is a recurring theme in the much longer narrative, and that is probably an accurate historic detail about what happened during those times. It reminds me a little bit of the starvation that's happening now in Yemen and about refugees and families of undocumented immigrants. And I also think about people in a position like Sarai's who are forced into something against their will for someone else's protection or for their own protection. Abram and Sarai are lucky. The time passes. The story goes on. Sarai gives her slave Hagar to Abram as a second wife or concubine, and Hagar conceives. Hagar gets a little uppity about this. Sarai turns against her, and Hagar runs away. But then an angel comes to Hagar, telling her to return, promising, now you have conceived and shall bear a son, you shall call him Ishmael, for the Lord has given heed to your affliction. And a little while after that, Abram has a vision in which his God gives him a new name. From now on, he is called Abraham, and his wife is Sarah. What do we make of this renaming? It could be a sign of his special relationship with his God. Maybe it's just further evidence of his habit of obedience. He's told what to do, and now now this is your name, and he says, okay. It might be a literary contrivance, a way editors 2,500 years ago or so decided to reconcile versions of a story that had different names for the main characters. What do names mean? What does your name mean to you? If you have children, how did you choose their names? As a little girl, I was sometimes jealous of the fact that my older sister Betsy, Elizabeth Ann, was named after the Queen of England. 
so the story went. And my younger sister was named for an aunt. I was not named for anybody. We just liked the name, my parents would say, which was very unsatisfying. Some people change their names. When people marry, they often make choices about surnames. Both of them keep their own. One person takes the other. In heterosexual marriage, when this happens, it's conventional for the woman to take the man's name, but that's not always the case. Sometimes also both partners might hyphenate or they might use both names. I have friends who made up a new surname using syllables from both his and her original ones, and they believe they're the only people in the country with that name. People change their first names, too. I knew someone who changed her name from Barbara to Rachel when she was in her 40s. It's not unusual for teenagers to change their names. I know several who have done that. Some of them are adopted, some not. My niece took back her original Cambodian name, which her mother had kept as her middle name. My niece and my friend Carol were both claiming something important about their identities in that decision to change their names. People change their names to make a claim, to signify a commitment, to start over, to separate themselves from the person or people who named them, to try to disappear. And in many religious traditions, people choose an additional name as part of the coming of age ritual. In Catholicism, for example, it's conventional to take the name of a saint. And it's worth noticing in Bible stories who does the naming. Sometimes it's an angel who delivers the message, and you shall call him Ishmael. And sometimes it's a rare moment where the woman actually gets to make a decision. So this story goes on, Ishmael is born, time passes, Visitors come again. Abraham welcomes them with abundant hospitality, as was the custom. And he hears that Sarah will bear him a son within the year. And Sarah, who is not allowed to socialize with the men, but she's serving them and eavesdropping, Sarah laughs. She is 90 years old, and she has never been able to conceive or bear children. The son she will have is named for that laugh, His name, Isaac, means laughter. It turns out that as a character in the story, he isn't given very much to laugh about. There's more to this later. So if you're tired of Netflix, or you want something different to read, you could dip into the book of Genesis. You might want to see if you can tell which are the Elohim stories. Those are the ones that refer to the Lord. And which are the Yahweh stories. Those are the ones that refer to God. It will not all make sense. But it could take you on a journey or several journeys into your own experience, into your own life, into a time and place from long, long, long ago. It could make you wonder remind you of something you've forgotten. You might decide it's way too foreign, or despite the passage of time and difference of culture, you might find something there that feels true to human experience, to your own experience, to your beliefs about what it takes to be a moral and ethical person, about choices that you've made about humanity's place in the web of life, about human relationships, or about who and what God may be and mean. You might even find something in the poetry or in a story that feels true to the intangible things of which Sophia Lyon Foz wrote. Things that our eyes do not see, our ears do not hear, that our hands do not touch, and time cannot measure.
I invite you to sing with us now hymn number 335, Once When My Heart Was Passion Free. May you go, may you experience a moment's interval of peace, of knowing, of contentment, of mystery. Go now in peace. Thank you, Booker.